In the third millennia BCE, early astronomers from Mesopotamia mapped the stars, giving names to constellations and planets. They called the red planet Nergal, after their god of war. For the ancient Greeks, the celestial body was likewise their god of war, Ares. The ancient Romans gave it the name we use today, Mars. Over a thousand years later, in 1609, Galileo used the newly invented telescope to get a closer look at the red planet. By the 19th century, advanced telescopes allowed astronomers to see details of the planet's surface. They saw what came to be thought of as vast canals, surely evidence of civilization. People became fascinated with the idea of life on Mars. And then, in 1964, we did something those Mesopotamian astronomers could only have dreamed of. We sent a craft, the Mariner 4, on a 228-day journey to orbit the Red Planet. Viking 1 touched down on July 20th, 1975, and sent back the first images from the Martian surface. On NBC Nightly News, astronomer Carl Sagan reacted to this unprecedented feat with a characteristically broad perspective. I think it uh, gets to something very deep in, in human nature, the, the will to explore, the lust for discovery, the curiosity, I think, is something built extremely deeply into us as an essential part of our nature, and the Earth is all explored. Here is a way with inexpensive machines of extending ourselves beyond our planet and uh, I'm just delighted with the whole business. We've since landed seven more objects on Mars to study topography and geography, and in the process, learned that those canals, which incited such a frenzy, turned out to be nothing more than an optical illusion. NASA landed the InSight lander on Mars in November 2018 to finally explore the interior structure of the four and a half billion year old planet and give us a greater understanding of all planetary evolution, including that of our own. The next step may have been inevitable since those ancient Mesopotamians first began to look up. From NASA, to the United Arab Emirates, to the private company SpaceX, several disparate plans are underway for us to make the greatest journey in our history as a species. Will we get there? Carl Sagan thought so. Maybe we're on Mars because of the magnificent science that can be done there. The gates of the wonder world are opening in our time. Or maybe we're on Mars because we have to be, because there is a deep nomadic impulse built into us by the evolutionary process. We come, after all, from hunter-gatherers and for 99.9% .9 of our tenure on Earth, we've been wanderers, and uh, the next place to wander to is Mars. But whatever the reason you're on Mars is, I'm glad you're there, and I wish I was with you. Yes, we are going to Mars. Humans, we humans are going to Mars. Uh, there's, a, there's a bunch of different plans to do that. Elon Musk says he's, we'll get there 2024, 2025. Uh, NASA makes it more like 2030, maybe even 2040. It ain't cheap. Uh, Musk, who's going to send a crew of 12, says the cost will be more than 10 billion with a B per person. Uh, other estimates eclipse 500 billion. So we can't exactly afford that here at the World Science Festival, uh, but we can take a hypothetical trip to Mars. And that's what we're going to do here this evening, giving all of us a sense of what it might be like to take that long dreamed of destination. And of course, to take that journey through space, we're going to need a crew. So let's bring them out. Trekkies, take note. We all know that a spaceship needs an, needs an engineer, and we need our own Captain Janeway, and we have her. 
At NASA, she has worked with boosters, with environmental control and life support systems, spacesuits and extravehicular activity tools. She currently leads the Mars Integration Group, developing crewed Mars missions concepts. Please welcome Michelle Rucker. <laughs> a, ship's, a doctor on our ship is also necessary. And ours was a colonel in the United States Air Force, where she served as a senior flight surgeon prior to her selection to the NASA Astronaut Corps in 1996. At NASA's Ames Research Center, she was the lead astronaut science liaison and strategic relationships manager for Google and other Silicon Valley programmatic partnerships. Say hello to Dr. Yvonne Cagle. Our science officer is not a Vulcan, but she knows about volcanoes. She is the principal investigator on the NASA-funded Hawaii Space Exploration Analog and Simulation Project, or High Seas, which conducts long-duration space exploration simulations on Mauna Loa on Hawaii. A planetary geologist and specialist in AI, please welcome Kim Binstead. And we couldn't go anywhere without our ship's captain. Ours was the chief scientist at NASA for more than 25 years, working on missions including the exploration of Mars, Venus, and Saturn. She is currently director of the Smithsonian's National Air and Space Museum. Please welcome Ellen Stofan. <laughs> what a crew. Welcome to all of you and to all of you. And I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge something that is, of course, obvious, but certainly bears noting. For more than a millennia, Mars the planet has been associated with, um, men, <laughs> to the extent that the symbol for male is the symbol for Mars. Tonight we change that. Eat your heart out, Mark Watney, this is the future. <laughs> So, our journey tonight uh, has three stages, like, like every interplanetary journey. Uh, stage one is going to be the launch. Stage two is the voyage. Stage three, our new home. And of course, we're going to start with where we have to start, which is the launch. How to get us off of this planet and onto that one more than 100 million miles away. Um, we know how most rockets, how all rockets have launched. You light a match, you burn something, up it goes, right? A little explosion and you're off. Works just fine, has worked so far. But Michelle, there are some drawbacks to the standard launch approach for Mars, is that right? What, what should we be looking at instead of what we've looked at in the past? So, so chemical propulsion is what we, we typically use. It's, it's been a, a good standby um, for uh, economy of scale. We like to launch bigger and bigger systems. Uh, the, the system that NASA is developing now, the, the space launch system, is a heavy lift capability. Uh, that's what we'll need to get a lot of stuff either to the moon or to Mars. Um, you can launch a lot of little bitty rockets, but that's, uh, it's, it's, it's nice to be able to get some big systems up there too. Uh, so, the, so the SLS is in work. Uh, several of our, our commercial partners are also working on, on uh, similar chemical uh, rocket propulsion systems. Uh, there are some I, I know you're going to ask me. Go ahead and ask me. Ask me the question. <laughs> I wasn't going to get there yet. I was going <laughs> to do just, one other one let's, first, but let's just of get course that out I want to talk about the space elevator. I mean, we got to get there, but we'll get there in one second. Let me. Before we do that, what's what percentage of the weight on a rocket is fuel? I mean, the fuel is the biggie when you're taking off. Yeah, right? it depends on which fuels you're using. Um, Ooh, Yvonne probably has the, the numbers in her head for the shuttle. Um, I don't have them off the top of my head. Uh, I, I know the shuttle for itself. I don't know the exact number, but I know that most of the, the energy, most of the power is just in the making escape velocity get out of the atmosphere. Right. So is there a reason why we can't do it the same old way to get to Mars, as we've done with the shuttles, we've done it with everything else? Oh, we can. 
Sure, we can. But um, we got to go we, a lot further. We, we have to go a lot further. We have to take a lot of stuff with us. It's a, a longer journey, so we just need more stuff. Okay. Uh, that's, why the, that's, that's why the heavy lift is, is important, to be able to get uh, the large amount of equipment, um, the supplies that we'll need for a long journey. Okay, now I'll ask. <laughs> space elevator. Space elevator. It's, it's it, such an exotic concept, the idea of an elevator into space. Is it real? Is it science fiction? So I'm not an expert on the technology, but my understanding is it's uh, conceptually it, it would work. Um, there's some limitations in the materials right now. There's a lot of research and development being done. Uh, NASA did a report back in 2010 on sky, I think sky hooks and, and space elevators, um, and found that the materials advancement just isn't quite there yet for uh, being able to make that a reality from, for Earth. Uh, Potentially, it would work on the moon as well, uh, but right now there's a materials advancement issue just, that we need just, to work um, on. Can you give us the, <laughs> I hate to say, the elevator speech for the space <laughs> elevator. What's the, what's the short version of, of exactly how it works? It's basically a tether with a counterweight on the end. Um, so that begs a lot of questions about operations. Here on Earth, traffic management would be a problem. It's a very long tether. Um, I, at one point in my career, I worked on uh, hypervelocity impacts of spacecraft with space debris or, or uh, right. micrometeoroids. Uh, so I would worry about the tether being impacted. If the, if the, if the tether's damaged, what's your, what's your backup plan? Uh, so there's a lot of technical challenges. Um, right now, NASA doesn't currently uh, have a space elevator in the plans. Um, but uh, if anybody has a really good idea for either the materials <laughs> advancement, I would encourage you to uh, Go to your internet browser and look up NASA. It's NS, NSRTF, NASA Space Research Technology Fellowships. Uh, NASA supports uh, uh, graduate student research. Um, we're always looking for, for clever ideas and new, new technologies, new advancements in materials and, and different concepts. So um, we would love to hear some great ideas. I hate to ask, but are you suggesting that we don't know how we're going to get there? <laughs> no, no, I'm not suggesting that. Okay, fine. <laughs> no, and the exciting, space elevators. Pers the exciting space thing elevators. is, yeah, the exciting thing is now there's all these private companies that are helping to reduce the cost to low Earth orbit. Uh, you know, SpaceX, Blue Origin, and if we can start reducing the cost to low Earth orbit, that's going to help bring the cost of getting to Mars down. Right. Go ahead, Yvonne. And for all you Trekkie fans, the old uh, beam me at Scotty. I believe the space elevator is using microwave beam power to help sort of. Uh, accelerate a vehicle up the tether. And one of, the, one of the interesting things is the materials advancements that would need to be made to make a space elevator work, those materials could also be applied to traditional uh, chemical propulsion systems as well. So um, it's, it's not necessarily one or the other. The, the technologies might support uh, either or or something nobody's even thought of yet. Okay, so that's one possibility, space elevator. Another possibility, the lunar orbital platform Gateway, what's that about? Ellen? So, uh, yeah, so um, Gateway is a concept that NASA has been working on for about five years. And the idea is can we start to break that independence from the Earth uh, and go out to the vicinity of the moon, go into a lunar orbit, and basically have a smaller scale space station that would be sort of the test vehicle for the transfer vehicle that would get you to Mars? So we need to make some improvements on the space station. We need to make sure the systems are reliable. Life support is one of the most critical systems. So let's go test all those systems out in the vicinity of the moon, get where we can get home in three days if there's a problem. And then we'll go on to Mars after some, you know, a couple years of testing in lunar orbit, then we'll be ready to go on to Mars. It's also a great platform to use to then descend down to the lunar surface. If companies or countries want to go down to the lunar surface, it's a great platform to do that from. So we know how to get to the moon. Uh, we haven't lived on the moon. We've only gotten there. This is the uh, moon base to Mars idea, that yes. you would set up a base. And then is the idea that we would go from the moon to Mars, or is it that the moon just gives us a sense of how to function before we move on to Mars? You know, people have looked at different architectures, because obviously, when, you, when you're on a long-time long -term voyage to Mars, remember, it takes seven to eight months to get to Mars, where I know we're going to talk about that in a minute. Mm -hmm. But you're going to want a multi-module craft, because you're always going to want to have somewhere to retreat to um, if something goes wrong. Think Apollo 13. So the idea is, are, are we going to construct that vehicle in lunar orbit out by the gateway and leave from lunar orbit, which is a lot less energy than trying to leave from Earth orbit. Um, so people have looked at different, 
different scenarios, leaving from lunar orbit just takes less energy, so it's a lot easier. We're not doing this alone, are we? This is, we're now in the public-private world of space exploration. Uh, both uh, SpaceX and uh, Blue Origin have ways to get to the moon on the way to Mars. I, talk about that a little bit, Ellen. How much, how much is it going to be um, a partnership? I think it's going to be an incredible partnership, and you actually saw that on the Gateway slide. You saw those different acronyms up there. What those were were all the different space agencies of the world. So the European Space Agency, the Japanese Space Agency is JAXA, um, the Russian Space Agency wants to get involved, the Canadian Space So all of our partners from the International Space Station want to go onto the moon and onto Mars, and even countries that haven't been involved in the space station. Everybody wants this to be an international effort. And then on top of that, we have all these private companies. So I think it's going to be international, it's going to be public-private, and frankly, that's the only way I think we're going to get there. This is a big change, certainly, from the days of the race to the moon and our uh, uh, rivalry with the then Soviet Union. Um, today, we're seeing a very different thing. Yvonne, I wonder what the feeling is in the astronaut corps about the idea that this is a, a global enterprise rather than USA and a flag and all that. It's very exciting. It's uh, an opportunity to be collaborative, and we recognize that the space race is no longer between countries, but actually between industries and technology and capability. And if we work together, we can synergize and really go further, faster, longer. There was a time when we all believed, I think, that NASA was the only place that had the kind of technology that we trusted and that we believed in. Um, that's also changed. That, it, that well, I mean, how does NASA work with um, private companies now in order to to keep that level so high and the and keep the safety so high? Well, fortunately, um, NASA and the whole international effort of going to space is something that everyone has a part of. So the people are globally, and we're taking that global expertise and no longer centralizing it at NASA, but decentralizing it into industry and other areas. And so what this actually does is that that expert talent is something that we can outsource, but I don't mean outsource by taking it outside the agency or the country, but by taking it off planet. And what we can demonstrate off planet, we can bring back and actually help us here with our lives and our environment right here on Earth. Okay, let's get back to the actual launch. Michelle, the determination has to be made at some point what time to launch and exactly when to launch. How do you make that determination? What are the factors that go into that? So to go to Mars, uh, so Mars and Earth chase each other around the sun. They're, they're different orbits and they're traveling at different speeds. Um, and about every 26 months, there's an optimum alignment where you, you have the minimum amount of energy needed to get from Earth to Mars. Which means um, they're closest? Not necessarily the closest. So uh, the, the analogy we like to use is uh, if you're uh, passing a ball to someone, you don't, someone who's running, you don't aim at where they're at now, you aim at where they're going to be right. when you think the ball will arrive. And how hard you throw the ball uh, is equivalent to how hard we have to throw our, our spaceships. Um, you can throw it harder, but it takes more energy, and that translates into more equipment or more propellant, which right. could be more money. Uh, so you want to be able to, to do the easiest uh, throw that you can do, and that happens about every 26 months. Every 26 months, is there also a time of day? And what if that every 26 months is bad weather? I mean, do you have a window there's there? A, yeah, there's a several days of window on either side of that, the optimum time. But yeah. only several days. Uh, I think I've, it, it, it kind of depends on which system. Uh, each, uh, each opportunity is a little bit different. It, it, it varies a little bit from year to year. OK, we're going to move on now um, to the actual voyage. We have now figured out how to get there, whether it's the elevator, or whether it's uh, some combination of the elevator and or heavy lift and whatever. We're now on our way, whether we've gone from the moon or from here. Let's talk about this trip. First of all, give or take 100 million miles, is that right? 140, 100 million, something like that? So the, the number we like to use is, uh, if you're looking at the odometer on your spaceship, uh, to get to Mars and back again is about 2,000 times as far as going from here to the moon. The, the numbers themselves are so big, they're hard to wrap your head around sometimes. But 2,000 times as far as it is to the moon, um, that sort of puts it into perspective, and that's the round-trip journey. 
Yvonne, let me start with you. We're now on this voyage. We're now going to Mars. How long is it going to take? Wow. Well, um, it depends if we're doing it with or without a lunar assist, which is basically your slingshot. My preference is a slingshot, but if we were to do it the traditional way, we're looking at somewhere around nine months. Um, when we've put um, landers or probes or vehicles, it's been about, um, you know, uh, not quite a year, maybe somewhere between six to eight months. But for humans, since we have to take a little longer route, we're looking at nine months traditionally. If we do something that is more of a, um, a vehicle um, energy boost, we can get it down to six months. But then you're basically a, um, uh, a human projectile having a gravity assist that's accelerating you into the Martian atmosphere, through the atmosphere, into a very kind of accelerated landing. Back up for a second. Why do humans, why does it take longer, longer to send humans? Um, partly because of the human body itself, and also because of the kind of weight and supplies, the extra weight that will weight mass, since there's no weight in space, mass that we'll be carrying. So when you put all Which of means the... Which means human bodies or stuff that you're taking? Both, all okay. of that. Less now that we have 3D printers, so we'll be able to sort of manufacture things, added manufacturing where we're going. So we just have to bring the component um, materials. But there's still going to be some gear and equipment that we'll need to, to um, set up um, habitat. Let's talk about the stuff. What are we taking with us? Who wants to talk about what we're taking along? Oh, let, me, let me just uh, go back a little bit to what Yvonne said. So the biggest thing we've landed on Mars to date it was the Curiosity rover. That's about one metric ton. Um, Give us, with, it's like the size of a little this car, is, yeah, a little Jeep a or vehicle. something. Yeah. yeah, you all know about Curiosity, of course. The wonderful, S sweet little rover that's... ATV-like kind ATV. of... ATV, yeah. okay, fine. So, this is so the that's the largest thing, thing we've, thing we've landed. landed successfully yeah. on Mars. So if you want to land a crew of four... Um, now, the, the rover didn't need a life support system. It didn't need, you know, food. It didn't, uh, didn't need a potty. So the humans are going to need a lot more stuff. Stuff. And I, I'll, let, I'll let these guys talk a little bit more about this stuff. But uh, we're thinking on the order of about 20 times as much mass as Curiosity for a, a human scale lander. Uh, so it's a, it's a, it, it's a bit of a, of a jump in size. Go ahead, Kim. So a lot of the, the heaviest things that we're going to need to send are things like food and water. Mm -hmm. um, as well as all of the equipment to keep humans alive. And so that's why one of the factors in these mission designs that's so important is in situ resource utilization. And what I mean by that is if you have to bring all of the water to get your crew there, to keep them alive on Mars, and to bring them back home again, that's a lot of water, and that'll severely affect the mission parameters. But if you can send ahead an automated um, system that can extract some of the water that's already on Mars and make it usable for humans, then that cuts out roughly two-thirds of what you right. need. Uh, and that that's, makes a huge difference, and it makes some of these missions much more feasible. But that's still a piece of equipment somehow, or some version of a machine that has to be sent there. Right, but you'd want to send it first, because you'd want to be really, really, really sure that it's working. So, before, <laughs> before we have launched us, um, we're doing this hypothetical trip here, five of us and all of you, by the way. <laughs> so, before we've launched, have we sent up a bunch of stuff? Yes, almost certainly. On that the... has stuff that has unpacked itself, or is it waiting for us to unpack it's, it? It's unpacked itself. It has ho hopefully extracted water. It's hopefully um, taken some of that water and taken, extracted some oxygen from it, um, and uh, hopefully has uh, generated enough fuel to send us back again, so that when we get there, our ship home is already waiting, ready to go. So this is all robotic, obviously. Yes. So, we, so we're sending our, our home, our... Um, our uh, water system and a bunch of other things there. Surface power. You need power to run all of the robotics. So, so surface power ends up being a really key, uh, one of the first elements. That how, many, how many launches before the humans launch for one mission? It's, you know, the estimates have been anywhere from four to eight launches. And obviously, you could go up as much as you want. It just depends on exactly how much you're trying to, you know, pre-position. 
And this is all under the assumption that nobody there is going to wreck the stuff that we're sending up there, right? Exactly. <laughs> big assumption. Okay, no little green people. Yeah. Right. I think we're good with that. Yeah. We're, good at, we're good at that. It's very confident, Ellen. <laughs> yeah. I like that. If the that. little green men did take it apart, we would have learned something very important. Exactly. There you go. It's all about <laughs> science. I like that. Maybe look better. At spirit and opportunity. We're only supposed to survive on Mars for 90 days, and look at how long they survived. So we've gotten pretty good. Okay, but Lynn, you're stuff right. The um, robotic precursor missions will go, you know, up to two years before we actually land here. Up to two years. Mm -hmm. Oh, mm -hmm. so we could start sending them soon-ish. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Especially this issue. In fact, the Mars 2020 rover is actually going to do this first practice of in situ resource utilization. It's actually going to be pulling carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and basically putting it in a tank. That's a really simple first step, but it's a first step towards this. So we're already about to start practicing this, um, but the longer we have systems in place to start extracting water, ex extracting carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, the better off we're going to be. Exciting. Okay. Let's get back to our actual, we're now in the ship, we're on our way. Yvonne, let me get back to the, um, the medical stuff. Yes. Uh, start with radiation. We've well. all heard, <laughs> we know about radiation. Uh, it's worse the further the closer to the sun, obviously, but the further out. What are the dangers? What are we uh, dealing with? Well, it's interesting that you talk about that. Actually, the, the most, the greatest risk we have of radiation exposure is actually closer to the planet than you would expect because it's the GCRs, our uh, galactic cosmic rays. And this is just a kind of hosh posh of a lot of ionized material that's very close just outside our atmosphere between Earth and the moon. So actually, the moon has a greater risk of exposure than the deeper we go into space. Mm. Now, the deeper we go into space, closer to the sun, now you have your alpha particles and solar uh, flares and a lot more um, penetrating and damaging radiation. So it's just kind of, do you want the direct hit or do you want kind of the ripple effect? <laughs> and what do we know about radiation exposure on Mars itself? Uh, well, the atmosphere is much thinner, and so we're going to definitely need to protect ourselves. And what we've looked at is um, shielding the vehicle. The route there is really even a greater risk. So uh, shielding... Right, let's the... stick to that for now, then. Okay. okay. So how do we shield ourselves on the way there, and, right. and is there a danger to the vehicle as well as to ourselves? Yes, both. Both. The greatest, uh, the best radio protectant is water. But obviously, the up mass of that is um, not just cost prohibitive, but we just can't bring enough water for that. Um, to that end, we're looking at things like titanium. We're looking at different um, complex or carbon composites, um, lots of different materials that can be radio protective. Even when we get to the moon, the regolith, which is a soil on the moon, is somewhat radio protective as well. The big challenge will be on Mars with having such a thin atmosphere, mm -hmm. how do we best protect ourselves? And that'll influence where we place our habitat. Will it be on the surface, or will it be somewhere beneath the surface where we can have some protection from the radiation? Okay, we'll get to that when, when we get there. We're not there yet. We're still on the transition phase. One of the uh, things, I will ahead, say, Ellen. one of the things I've been looking at, and this is even for the Lunar Gateway, but then certainly for the Mars transfer vehicle, is if you, if you actually did take enough water, because obviously we've got to take water, let's use it smart. If you lined where the crew are sleeping, um, with protective water, that way you far reduce, if they're, say, 12 hours a day, they're in a radiation-protected area, it, it reduces overall risk. But you can't do that in the ship on the you way. You can't do the entire ship, but you can around the sleep quarters the whole way, yeah. So a, a water barrier. A, wa a water barrier just around the sleep quarters. A water quarters. feature, as we say. Exactly. Well, <laughs> so uh, another thing we're looking at is just the, the, the cargo, the consumables, the, the food, for example. Um, storing that in a way where you take advantage of the... Because that the, could also get damaged by radiation or... or uh not so much. It was, it, food, food is pretty sturdy. In fact, okay, we, we deliberately irradiate food on Earth, so... Uh. <laughs> uh, le that's true. Um, uh, Yvonne, one more for you before I move on to Kim and the psychological issues. Um, Yvonne, there, um, the space, the ISS, the space station, has given us an opportunity to learn about individuals, humans living in space. Mm -hmm. Mark and Scott Kelly, famously the twins study when one of them was on, in the ISS and one was on Earth. What have we learned that helps us know how to um, manage our bodies for this eight to 10 month journey to Mars? Well, very quickly, let me characterize, besides being a human aquarium surrounded by water so that you're radioprotectant, 
Um, the other way that you can protect yourself from radiation is to actually have your stem cells drawn before you leave the planet and basically have them carried with you, um, preserve them, and be able to sort of harvest them and replant them if we were to take a big radiation hit. Wow. So we would quarantine ourselves for several weeks or more and then slowly allow our bones kind of to reharvest our blood supply and give us back that immunity because that's where radiation does affect us. It reduces our immune capacity along with some other conditions. Um, the other thing that can happen is when you first go into space, um, your blood volume starts to float towards your head and it congests your ears and kind of gives you this kind of foggy space brain initially, but over time it can affect your, um, your, your uh, focus to some degree, but your vision, you can become more farsighted we're seeing. The other things that can happen is it can change uh, your taste and actually make foods and medicines harder to absorb because of some of the congestion that happens in your stomach. So how do we guard against that? Well, the important thing, and Kim will talk about it, is being very smart about our nutrition, changing it up so that we don't get space anorexia, which comes from appetite fatigue, eating the same thing, the same texture, same colors over time. Um, the other thing that we can do is find different ways to administer medicines, maybe through the nose, nasal sprays, as opposed to having to ingest it in some cases. If we get sick or injured, our surgeries need to be done through a tube so that we're able to contain our body fluids. Mm -hmm. um, you can't just slice somebody open in microgravity. There you go. Because the blood will all fly Everything around. floats, right. absolutely. And the other concern is certainly with our bones um, demineralizing or thinning out, and our muscles weakening, that affects our heart and our ability to exercise, our exercise tolerance. And that can very much not only affect our performance, but if we were to get injured, if we were to strain a muscle or ligament or break a limb, we're going to heal very slowly. And that might be enough time to slow down our resiliency and our strength and turn us from a Mars visitor to a pioneering Mars welcome wagon committee. <laughs> Right. where we don't come home as quickly as we would have anticipated, which is not necessarily a bad thing. But what, all the things you're describing are, are um, w w as a result of what we've learned about long duration um, space travel, and so we know how to deal with some of the physical issues that may affect our bodies. Right, right. Kim, let me turn to you now. We've, you know, the five of us have had lovely chats in the green room. We get along just fine for, you know, the last hour. We're going to be on this spaceship for eight to ten months. Kim, um, how do you figure out the optimal crew so that we don't claw each other's eyes out for well, a couple yeah, days? Well, yeah, it's a real problem. You know, if you were to... So I run a um, Mars analog habitat in Hawaii, and what we do is we take groups of six people and we put them in a habitat and have them pretend that they're on Mars for four to 12 months. Um, and we pick people who are very astronaut-like in their psychology, because one thing we already know is if you just picked six people off the street and did this, they would be killing each other within days. Uh, what's, what's an astronaut-like psychology? Well, there's a lot, of <laughs> <laughs> a lot of different tests, but a colleague uh, summarized it as a thick skin, long fuse, and an optimistic outlook. And to that, for a Mars trip, I would add easily entertained, uh, <laughs> Easily amused is what she's trying to say. <laughs> because if you really need to go clubbing every weekend, or if you, you know, need to meet new people, or need to go climb a mountain every day, you're, you're not going to have a good trip. Um, so you know the kind of personality types you need. What about putting together a crew? We need one of these, one of these, one of these. How do you do that? So yeah, you're going to need a bunch of different skill sets. You're also going to need, in addition to the technical skill sets, uh, a bunch of different approaches to conflict resolution, to leadership, followership, and so on. So I like to liken it to a toolbox. Um, if you're filling a toolbox, you wouldn't fill it with hammers, even if they were all the world's best hammers. Um, and you also wouldn't fill it with Swiss Army knives, um, because there's a compromise that comes with having all of those uh, identical sets of skills. Instead, you want to have people with strengths in different areas, with different life experiences, uh, with different approaches to interpersonal uh, reaction, uh, interactions and so on. Uh, and that's, that's really how you go about it. How about it. relatives? Is a good 
uh, to have people who are... Oh, I, <laughs> I think <laughs> that's a no. <laughs> okay, uh, I'll, I'll give you two at once. Relatives, marriages. Okay, so uh, <laughs> I'm not turning it down completely, but there's some risks with that, as you might imagine. And one of the risks is a rift with the rest of the crew. Um, if two people have a very close uh, relationship, that could break them off into a subset, and you really don't want to cause those rifts in any way. Another way you cause rifts is uh, by having this sort of clustering. So, for example, imagine you had a crew of three men and three women, um, three people from a civilian background and three from a military background, three engineers, three scientists. Fine, that sounds all right. But what you don't want to have is three female civilian scientists and three male military engineers because they're going to split into those two groups. Right. So you try and avoid those kind of alignments as much as possible. So that, I think, is the risk with those kind of close relationships that you're talking about. What about um, in day, let's say, eight, we have a fight? They're not going to have it in day eight. <laughs> um, I'm betting at about the six-month mark, because that's what we see in our simulations. Um, basically, you know, you've got these people who are actually really good at getting along with each other. They've got a lot of these interpersonal skill sets. Because uh, you work at it. I mean, you yeah, think about absolutely. this and you're... Yeah, but we can do that. We can work at this. Yeah, okay. well, what we found, I think NASA would have loved it if we could have come back and said, look, avoid factor X and you won't have any conflict. But it's just not the case. Anytime you have a group of people together for that long, you're gonna have conflict. And it comes from all sorts of different sources. Interpersonal issues, stresses from back home, disagreements over something important. Um, but what you really do need is to have this resilience to conflict. You need to have individuals and in a group of people who can have a conflict and then come back from it and return to a high functioning state. Excellent. And is there, um, some kind of chain of command that's important, like a military chain of command? Yes, there'll be a chain of command. Uh, we haven't found that the style of command matters all that much. You could have a, the military very hierarchical style, or you could have a more consensus-driven style. But one thing that's really important is that the style is agreed on, right. and that your leader and your followers share the same style, or can share the same style. Is it a democracy, or is it... Um uh, uh, somebody's in charge. Uh, I, would, I wouldn't say voting is what you're looking for, but um, I, I imagine that uh, any commander on this kind of mission is going to have to be good at listening to the rest of the crew. Okay. Um, Ellen and Michelle, talk about uh, what we may have learned from Mir, the, the then Soviet space station, and uh, ISS. What have we learned about people getting along together? Ellen? Well, we've certainly learned how to live in space. I mean, a lot of the lessons that we've learned from high seas are the exact same lessons we've learned in space. It's how do we get along? How do we get past conflict? How do we understand roles and responsibilities? How do you bring people together from different cultures to solve problems? Uh, and how do we get all these systems to work uh, reliably? And that's obviously been what we've been doing up on the ISS. And I, it blows my mind. We've had, what, now 17 continuous years of living in space continuously. They're up above us. It's, it's amazing. And if anybody hasn't ever looked at the app, spot the station, if you, if you Google the website. And about every two weeks, the ISS comes over New York City, and you can look up and you can see it, and you can wave to them. Um, they can't see you. Just, just, <laughs> but, but it's incredible to me. You look up there and you say, ah, there's six humans in space above us. How magical is that? One thing I'd like to add to that is, as you suggested, um, the space systems are systems of systems and subsystems and subsystems. And the human systems are part of that. Uh, so if the, the human part of that system of systems breaks, it can be just as catastrophic as if the rocket blows up. Right. So uh, we need to understand how these, all these things work together and test them over these years and years of operations. Well, surely one of us is going to have a bad day, but worse than that, there could be actual mental health issues, depression. Uh, doctor, what, what do we do about that? Uh, well, um, for one thing, um, the, the sleep deprivation. So when we're in space, we're sleeping less. There's lots of excitement going on. There's lots of work. And sleep deprivation can make, um, I don't know, tolerances and coping ability. It starts to erode it over time. Right. So sleep is one of the most important, and not just the number of hours, deep restorative sleep. And that means you have to adjust the lighting during the day, but also during sleep. It means that you have to exercise to keep your body in 
your whole lymphatic system mobilized and moving so that you can really refresh and detox and be able to be restful when you do go to sleep. Nutrition is a very important part of it. And all of these things, along with diversion and some distraction or in, on the entertainment side, can really help to keep people um, from getting too wrapped around the axle and keep things sort of restored and refreshed. So that's the most important thing of all. What have we learned um, uh, from the, this continuous occupation, uh, uh, habitation and space? What have we learned about entertainment? What works? What's a good thing to tell people to bring? Wow. Uh, it varies, but things like exercise, that's probably the best of all, movement. Um, then it would have to be some sort of arti artistic uh, persuasion, something along the lines of music or writing, looking out the window, taking pictures, finding some way to express and share and communicate. Attachment, having some connection with family and friends and and even what's happening in the news on Earth is very important too, that sense of attachment. Um, and then just being able to... Which means communication back to Earth has to be established, has to be continuous. Right, very and much so. And for our eight to 10 months trip to Mars, do we have constant communication with Earth? Not constant. Often we lose our signals, um, and when we reacquire that signal, um, there can be communication delays, and when we're on moon, on well, moon, there's three minutes um, in, in most cases, but on Mars, there's a 20 minute delay each way. So you can have 40, 45 minutes before. Um, and that's something that you can that makes learn. makes for an awkward conversation. Yeah, it does. It's, but it's not much different than on Earth with some individuals. It's true. <laughs> back, <laughs> back to the family we were talking about. Sometimes Good point. it's longer. Good point. But I, but I will say the, the one thing that's very important in terms of um, working together is having people on the crew going long duration, who are able to not just take space, but give space. So on shorter missions, when it's two weeks long, you can have someone who's the life of the party and entertaining, but when it's two years long, then you want someone who's able to give space in a very small environment, and that's an art in itself. That's a, that's a big decision. Go ahead, Kim. I just wanted to add, uh, we, we stumbled across an interesting way to stay in touch with home. Uh, during high seas, uh, one of our crew, her, she brought some barrettes for her hair, and they broke. Uh, so she s emailed her family and asked them to try and find a 3D printable barrette. Um, and they weren't able to find one, or they found one, and then they were able to design pretty flowers on it and stuff that she liked. They sent her the design, and she printed it at the habitat. Oh my. So this is a way, you can imagine, um, you know, your kid back home does an art project, you scan it in, and then you can print it out at the station. So it's a way to, to Make stay that tactically connection, in touch. Tactile thing. Yeah. yeah. So, go ahead, Michelle. Speaking of broken equipment, you asked what we've learned on the space station. One of the most interesting things from, from the, the work I did was, uh, uh, when things would break, um, initially in the space station, we had the, what we called the orbital replacement units. We would just bring the whole thing home on the shuttle, send up a new one. Because the shuttle was going back and forth and it was fairly easy to do. Uh, when the shuttle stopped flying, uh, with, we had the accident and, and, and it was grounded, uh, we had to learn to repair things in orbit that weren't necessarily designed to be repaired. And so when you're taking apart uh, fine machinery with little tiny itty bitty screws uh, that, that could be floating away from you in microgravity, that's, right. that's very challenging. And uh, so, so it was a learning process. It, we, we would send the instructions to the crew. Um, in some cases, we had uh, video that yeah. we would send up to them. We even get their families involved in some cases uh, right. with, you know, to say hello and, and uh, do the video on, on the repairs. And uh, uh, one of the ones I remember was the, the treadmill. Uh, exercise is important, and the treadmill had some problems. And uh, so we sent up the instructions. The, the, the treadmill was taken apart on orbit and repaired on orbit, even though it was not meant to be right. done that way. But you figured um, out a way to do it. And we figured out a way to do that. So, uh, so the, one of the challenges for going to Mars, because it's such a long trip, right. if things break, we can't just send a new No, part. you've got to figure out so a way. We'll, we'll I'm thinking of the there. early shuttle days and the famous the fly swatter when they had to reach, right. reach a switch. Right. And, and configured something that looked like a fly swatter to make it work that Ray Seddon did, yeah. which was quite, a, quite I mean, very inventive. Yeah. Uh, uh, these things can happen. And, and you have to use what you have on board. Use that, what you have, that's, okay. That, that's what's going to be One thing you can't invent unless you have the right tools is food. What are we going to eat on this trip? Now, we're, we're trying to pare it down as much as possible. We can't take mm -hmm. every single thing we want. Food? 
Well, let me revisit this one when we're actually on the surface of the planet, because the food we're going to be eating on the way is pretty similar to what they're using on ISS. And it has to be, because in microgravity, it is really hard to cook. You could put the food in the bowl, and it floats out again. Um, so, uh, yeah, pour your sauce on your pasta, and it's everywhere. Um, not so my cooking. You've never had this <laughs> stick. It's not. <laughs> even in the digestive system, it's not going anywhere. Uh, but let's revisit this when we get to the surface. Okay, fine. So you're, you're going to assure me that there's room for all the prepackaged things that I'm going to heat up in the little whatever the heating up equipment is on the on the. So for eight or ten months, I'm going to eat. Space food, basically. Exactly. It's dehydrated food that you just add water right. to and mush it up, and it's kind of ready to eat. But I will say, this is one of the many areas where things we develop for space actually have a real and important value back here on Earth. Because if you think of food that has to last for months and months, if not years, and be stable and not go bad, and be able, for example, to be maybe sent into disaster zones or places on Earth where people right. are starving, having NASA space food actually has huge benefits to people right here on Earth. That, that's another area. When I talk to young people, um, there's a perception that you have to be a rocket scientist to do what, what we do. Um, but there's a lot of different aspects of a space flight. So if you like to cook, um, food science is huge. Why are you pointing to me huge. when you say that? <laughs> <laughs> if, any, if anyone out there likes to cook, um, you know, food research, uh, shelf life stability, uh, just the packaging, uh, there's a, just a lot. You don't have to be a rocket scientist to participate in a space mission. That's, that's a, kind of a key point that I, I, I try to talk with young people about. You can be a space foodie and more. This okay. Space foodie. And more. <laughs> yeah. Let's talk about um, our, our home on the way there. What does it look like? What are we flying in? I mean, the original, the original, the Mercury, the Gemini capsules were pretty small. Uh, shuttle was obviously larger. Are we somewhere in between? Are we bigger? What's the, what does it look like, the vehicle? I, it's going to have to be bigger. I mean, there's, because you're, it's just too long, and you've got to have a separate place where people can sleep. You've got to have separate modules for safety purposes, as I said earlier, because you've got to have uh, alternatives for people to go. But the smaller it is, the better. Can, you get, can any of you give me a design concept? I mean, there's something up on the screen now. Is it going to it looks like sort of a, a dirigible or uh, what? What's it going to look like? A blimp? I mean, one of the big debates is whether or not you try to simulate gravity. Um, so one way to do that is to, well, there's many ways. One is the kind of wheel design that you saw in, I think, the 2001. Martian had, 2001 had that. Uh, another is a tethered system. So you have a, your ship and maybe a weight or another ship, and you whirl them around like this. But there's a lot of risks that come with that kind of spinning. As you imagine, mm -hmm. if something goes wrong, Gone. Yeah. Yep. Um, I so, saw that movie too. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, a lot of the designs, most of the designs we're looking at these days don't do the artificial gravity uh, route, although it would have a lot of health benefits. Right. And if we're looking at, um, you know, uh, Orion, for example, is a capsule and it's a smaller version, so it's really going to have just travel riding space. There's not going to be a lot of li living work type of space going on. And so one of the things that we've talked about and we're looking into is human hibernation, putting us into suspended animation where our metabolic, our physiologic, our body rate is slowed way down, sort of like if you were to do cold immersion, so that we can sleep for the majority of it and then when it's time, wake up, get our systems going again, and we're off and running with this precursor, robotic precursor habitat that's just waiting with this fine, beautiful feast and water and everything that we'll be That's looking for. That's the welcome to. wagon. The welcome I wagon. I got it. Okay. So on the way there, incidentally, um, is there constant um, fuel happening? Is there constant propulsion or are we somehow in, a, in an orbital field where we don't need that? How, wh what do we need to get there? So there's a couple different options for, for in-space propulsion. Um, one of the ones we're looking at now would be used for, for Gateway, the solar electric propulsion. Um, the, the, the guys I work with, uh, the analogy they use is solar electric propulsion. It's a, it's a low thrust. It's, it's like being fifth gear in a, in a car. Um, so it's a nice, steady, very efficient method. 
And um, it's constant? or it, 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 Not necessarily. You're making course corrections. Uh, but when you need uh, uh, longer burns to, to do your, your maneuvering, uh, solar electric is a very efficient way to do it. Um, chemical uh, is, is good. It's like first gear in a car. It gives you that oomph to, to get, out of, get out of traffic there. Um, we've been looking at hybrid systems that maybe take the best of both worlds in, in one package. How about nuclear? In, uh, nuclear is uh, that's an option. There's a lot of research being done on that. So there are different different um, possibilities to get us there. Okay, we're we're almost there. Now you got to land us. How do we land on the surface of that's Mars? That's the tough part. <laughs> that's the hard part. It's the hard part. <laughs> yeah, entry, descent, and landing is going to be the hardest thing. And the, the issue is that Mars has uh, it obviously has a lot more gravity than the Moon had, but it also has an atmosphere. Um, but the problem with Mars's atmosphere is there's enough of an atmosphere there to heat you up as you come in, but there's not enough atmosphere there to really slow you down. So if anybody's seen the great JPL uh, video they put together before Curiosity called Seven Minutes of Terror, they really well explain that, that terror of entering the Mars atmosphere. So you have to really do things like how do you slow down when you're coming in at hypersonic speeds? And it's, it is not an insurmountable problem, it's just tough. And we've got to figure out how to do it for a lot more than the one metric ton of mass we landed at Curiosity. There's some, there's some really interesting technologies being developed. Um, uh, there, there's an inflatable technology, we call it the HIAD, the hyper, hi, hypersonic inflatable aerodynamic decelerator, because we like really <laughs> big words. Uh, but then we just call it the HIAD because nobody can say all that. <laughs> or then um, you make up an acronym that none of us can remember anyway. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, so, so that's an inflatable technology. There's another uh, a deployable, basically deploying large surfaces to get you that, that aerodynamic uh, uh, assist when you're, when you're trying to, to enter and land. Uh, retro propulsion, that, that's another... Uh, we're used to that from, yeah. from Apollo, yeah. certainly in Gemini. Uh, yeah. One of the things we're looking at is uh, for some of the some of the precision landing that we'll have to do on the moon, uh, can we take those technologies and mature them enough and then be able to use the same thing for Mars without having to start fresh for Mars? Use, use as much of the technologies as possible. But unlike the shuttle, it will not land like an airplane on the surface of Mars because of the atmosphere? There is one concept that looks like something a like that. There's a, we call it the mid L over D um, concept. Uh, but there's no runway. It would it would be more like a kind of you know there, there'd be rockets to slow you down when you got close. So uh, it's got to come in vertically or some version of that to the yeah. way we're used to seeing things. It's going to be some combination. Yeah. It, it like Curiosity, it's probably going to use a combination of things to slow it down. Probably ending with parachutes. But I always want to point out, for as daunting as some of these things we're talking about seem like. Um, in this year, 50th year of celebrating humans landing on the moon for the first time, remember at where we started from and eight and a half years later we were actually standing on the moon. We, we are so far ahead of understanding what exactly the engineering challenges are. We're so far down the road on them. Th so I, I, get, I get stressed when people start thinking, oh my gosh, this is such a hard thing. Oh my God, we're so far ahead of where we were when we started we out on this. the way to the moon. Okay, we've done it. Right. We're, you know, maybe 10 months in. We're not, we've landed, and we've landed safely, and we're here. And our robotic um, earlier ships have set up everything that we need. Here we are. Um, first thing let's talk about is in order to simulate what we will be living in in this environment, um, a number of places are, are building um, habitats to simulate what it will be like on Mars. And I, I think we have an image, um, or the, one of the many images. The United Arab Emirates are planning to spend $140 million uh, to build a Martian prototype city outside of Dubai as preparation. Um, there are a number of these things happening in other parts of the world as well. Kim, you've done a lot of these simulations. How long does one go into one of these simulations? How long do they last? It, it varies. So at high seas, we're one of the longer ones. So our longest mission was 12 months. Um, although, How many people? That was six people in okay. a small space, about 1,000 square feet, so a smallish apartment. 
in the rest of the world, in New York, it's a mansion. Um, <laughs> and and uh, yeah, so that's for 12 months. The Russians did one for 520 days um, okay. a few years back, which is the longest one on record. But there's also what we call serendipitous analogs. So those are these mission-like conditions that kind of happen by accident. So that includes Antarctic exploration, submarines, mm -hmm jail populations, um, prison populations to some extent, um, and uh, we've learned a lot from those as well. And what have we learned? Well, in addition to the stuff we were talking about earlier, uh, so one is crew composition is really important. Um, another is that uh, supporting crew uh, over this time is really important. Do we have um, separate living quarters? You know, we do at high seas, and we think it's important to be able to... A to separate sleeping quarters. Se separate sleeping quarters, that is. So ours are very small. They're, um, gosh, I don't see anything comparable in size, but a little bit bigger than a small single bed. Right. Um, but they have a really key component, which is a door that shuts and locks. Uh, having that little bit of, of privacy, that personal space, is really important. What's the... Um, describe the atmos atmosphere, I mean, in the, in the broader sense. What's it like? On, what does it look like on Mars? What it's happens? We've dusty. just landed. What do we see? Sorry? It'll be dusty. <laughs> It'll be dusty, okay. <laughs> and kind of pink dusty, right? It, so yeah. the dust from an engineering, that's one of the engineering challenges. If, it, uh, if the dust coats are radiator panels, our thermal systems won't be as efficient. So we have to figure out how to keep the dust off the, the radiators. Uh, same with solar arrays. If, we, if they coat solar arrays, it'll reduce the efficiency. Is it dusty um, everywhere on Mars or just? In certain areas, there's uh, seasonal dust storms. Uh, we're getting we're getting a little bit better at, at we're not predicting weather on Mars, but we're sort of tracking things a little bit. We, you know, we haven't been watching Mars that long, um, and so you have to kind of look at, at at seasons over a long period of time to, to get the hang of the patterns. Uh, but uh, the dust storms seem to follow specific tracks, and uh, and they seem to be seasonal. Uh, so that helps us kind of be able to predict what we have to deal with. Uh, but, but dust, uh, if, if, you, if you bring dust into your house, it's kind of an annoyance just to keep it clean. If you bring dust into your habitat and it gets into the seals and you try to close the door and the, and the, the, the internal pressure is leaking, that could be a, a hazard. So uh, we have to pay a little bit of attention to that. That's one of those things that we'll learn about on the moon. Um, All right, but what are we fighting on Mars? And I say fighting because... We're humans, we're used to a certain um, set of circumstances that enable us to breathe, to walk, to live. What have we got, lay it out, what's the situation on Mars? Ex Ellen? Extreme temperatures, so um, it never gets much above, say, the freezing point, and it can get quite, quite cold, so that's certainly something we're gonna have to be con constantly aware of. Radiation. So Mars, does, unlike the Earth, does not have a magnetic field. So that radiation we experienced in space, okay, it's not as, as, as bad maybe as at the moon, but there's still a lot of radiation hitting you on the surface of Mars. We've measured that with an instrument on the Curiosity rover, so it's pretty well characterized. Um, let's see, what else? It's, uh, one of the things that I think is good is it's, it's not that alien of a landscape. You know, if you've been out in the desert in Utah or some places in the Middle East, I mean, those landscapes on Mars, which a lot of you saw on the Martian, um, aren't, aren't that dissimilar. The pressure is very different, so we have to be in pressurized space suits all the time or in a pressurized if habitat. If you're not in a pressurized space suit, what you happens? You die. You die. You die, right. <laughs> Quickly. You're essentially, your blood, boil, I mean, yeah. it, your blood boils. And, okay. So, if we're going to live on Mars for any amount of time, we must always be in a space suit if we're outside and we must always be in a sealed environment of some kind to be inside, yeah. to eat, to sleep, to work. Can't it's open a tough the window place. or a door. Can't open the window or the door. Let, let me just first ask the, the, the simplest question, which is, what does that do to the human psyche, not to be able to breathe outside, not to be able to go outdoors. It's one of the things the astronauts, I mean, Yvonne can talk about this better than I can, but it's one of the things when, when a lot of the astronauts will say, when I'll say, what's the thing you miss the most being on the space station? And let's say the wind on yeah. my mm -hmm. face, exactly. the smell of the air, the right. smell of rain. So I, I don't know. Can I share a Sure, a Kim. So uh, I did one of these missions up in the Canadian high Arctic. So we were sealed in for four months, only going outside in spacesuits. And when the mission was over, 
we walked outside without our spacesuits, and it was amazing. It's like you'd gone from a little black and white TV to this super high def world. And uh, it, we, there wasn't much to smell, but it was still a nice, clean smell. And we're out there for an hour, and then we went back into the habitat, and it stank. <laughs> <laughs> it was not right. a happy place. And we hadn't realized it because, of course, we've been in it the whole time. Um, so is there, uh, Yvonne, is there a psychological effect to um, not being able to feel the wind on your face? Um, feel the sun on your face? There, there very much is. There's something called sensory deprivation. And your uh, sensory system starts to kind of down mode over time. And that affects you psychologically. That can lead to depression, anxiety, or just a sense of detachment. It can disrupt your sleep. Um, and it can start to affect your health. And so that's why it's very important for us to have things within the station, within our environment, that can kind of bring that back. And there, it can be anything from the, the fabrics and, and the uniform or the clothes that you're wearing to the kinds of food that you're eating, texture it's and color, really important in that. to entertainment, diversion, humor, interaction, um, touch, feeling. All of these things are so important. And the habitat, clearly, the place where we're actually going to live is, is key to much of this. So NASA has, um, and partners, have launched the 3D Printed Habitat Challenge, a design competition to create the optimum Martian housing. Um, we can see some different versions, I think. Yeah, here we have some of, the, some of these images. Michelle, um, how does 3D printing help? You talked a little bit about how it helps us fix things. Well, I mean, we can create something while you're there. How does that work with this? You would so just a, have a bunch of these 3D printers there? A couple guys on my team went uh, and watched the, uh, this competition, and uh, they said it was really pretty, pretty amazing. Uh, so some of these things are cool looking. Yeah, one they of the are. winning, I think one of the winning uh, teams used a, a slurry, a, a mixture of, of materials. Mm -hmm. um, Big, so they have these industrial sized 3D printers now. I think the, the, there's some, they're starting to use them in construction with concrete. Um, the challenges, of course, with the nozzles clogging up, things like that. Uh, but yeah, th so 3D printing is uh, not just for making habitats, for, for making tools. Um, we've uh, actually practiced in some of, uh, some of the analog missions, we've, we've 3D printed tools on demand. Um, instead of having to take a whole big gigantic toolbox with right. you, maybe you could yeah. just print just the tools print that there. you need. Yeah. Okay, so the idea here is that you'd live in one of these things. Ellen, what about the idea of living in a lava tube underground? Could we do that? Uh, it would certainly give you that radiation protection. You need at least a meter, so at least three if, if feet, if not six feet of, of rock to protect you really from that radiation. So ultimately, if we want to stay on Mars for a long time, we've got to get out of the way of that radiation. And so a lava tube would be a way to do it. Now, obviously, that presents challenges because now you're back in an artificial light environment. Uh, you're not in a real light environment that has psychological effects. And so it's, it, but it's a really good option in terms of human protection. And it's already there. So you don't have to worry about, about creating that radiation protection. So we know the lava tubes are there, yes. which means, are we, are we planning on landing near any of them? Uh, those have been looked at as possible future landing sites. Okay. Can I point out there's another reason to be interested in lava tubes, and it, it ties back to the same thing, which is the radiation protection. Uh, if there was life on Mars, mm -hmm. um, it would also need protection from radiation. And so lava tubes are a really good place to look for signs of past or even possibly present life because it would be protected there. And also there's other reasons as well. It's more stable in the temperature. It's a place where uh, you know, uh, water in various forms might be found. So it um, would be a really good place to start looking. I do want to bring up one thing, and Yvonne can, can um, amplify on this much better since I'm a geologist, not a doctor. Um, but you know, the reason radiation is bad for you is that it, it breaks your DNA. And those breaks lead to things like cancer. So. It happens that some of us are actually better at repairing our DNA than others. Your DNA is always repairing itself. At some point, those repair mechanisms break down. So this is a really critical area of research. Again, space benefiting life here on Earth. The more we understand how to repair radiation damage so that maybe we can learn to live with radiation, I think helps us live on Mars, but it also helps us live on Earth. Mm -hmm. And that brings up the subject not only of radiation damage, but of germs in general. What are we going to do, first of all, 
to combat any viruses, germs. You tell me what can, what can attack. And at what point do we have to worry about contaminating the environment in mm -hmm. some way? I do have one piece of good news on that, which is that if you send a crew of, say, six people, um, they are very quickly going to share all of the germs that they are going to see for a long time. Uh, so we found with our crews that after maybe an initial period, um, they just didn't really get sick because... Isn't that interesting? Already... You built, they built up an immunity exactly. based on everybody else's germs. The problem is then when they came out uh, and then interact with the rest of the population again, they all got sick. Oh, so. well. Um, okay. Yeah. Well, we're not coming back for a yeah. while, so we'll see. <laughs> but we are coming back. We are coming back. Yvonne, what, what about um, general health issues while we're living there? Um, general health issues. Well, you touched on one thing that's important, our galactic responsibility. We want to make sure that we don't contaminate a planet that we're trying to learn more about. And um, lighting and UV can help with that, but it doesn't do a whole lot to protect us. So we're going to be exposed to microbes between each other, maybe microbes that we don't even know, the microbiome of other possibly alien life forms, but also we're going to evolve and change too. Our immune systems will be stressed because of radiation, the flight, lack of sleep, other medical mm -hmm. um, issues that are going on, but also we're going to change our own microbiome and we may not be as tolerant of ourselves as when we left the planet. So all of these things are very important to us to think about what happens to the genetic code if we become too restrictive. Now, we could put ourselves in a bubble and make things very um, protected from us in both directions, but what does that do to our resiliency? And we found over time that one of the reasons we've been able to persist as a human species is this intermingling of the environment and microbiomes. Mm -hmm. So maybe we do want to interact, and maybe that's part of the code of human survivability. Somewhere else. Um, what are we eating, by the way? Uh, please tell me ah. it's not potatoes. Now we get to open it up a little <laughs> bit. You know something, one of the reasons I love that movie is before it came out, people were always very skeptical about the food research we do at high seas. They would, oh, just give your astronauts a protein pill, they'll be fine. Uh, and now all I have to say is remember when he ran out of ketchup. You know, we're that's talking it. about the movie The, the Martian, Martian, of course. Yeah. That's right. Um, but yeah, so one of the joys of being on a planetary surface, even one with less gravity than the Earth, is there's enough gravity and enough, a little bit more space, so you're going to be able to cook. And there's a lot of good reasons to do that. One is that bulk stored ingredients are much easier to keep shelf-stable shelf -stable. and highly nutritious for these long durations. So, you know, a bag of flour is going to last a lot longer than a sealed-in piece of bread. Right. Um, another is that there's less packaging. And when you're going to Mars, mass is everything. So, so we're going to be making our own bread, is what you're telling is me. Is what I'm telling you, yeah. And then the other part is this combinatorics. So uh, you know, if, you, um, if you've got a lasagna, pre-prepared lasagna, it's always going to be a lasagna. But if you give someone noodles and tomato powder and herbs and spices and cheese powder, they can combine these things in a bunch of different ways. So you get a much larger range of possible meals out of a Now, in the, in the habitat, will that be um, Earth gravity or will that be moon, uh, Mars gravity? Mars gravity. Yeah, it's not really... Okay. Not in the current range so of technology. So Mars gravity is what? A third, uh, a roughly, a third yeah. of, uh, of Earth. So you can cook okay in a third gravity? Yeah, some things are going to work differently, but, but yeah, no. The basic... It's a little casual of you when yeah. that first cake <laughs> just <laughs> completely collapses. and popcorn, yeah, but, you know. Yeah. Okay. You yeah. still wouldn't want an open flame. That would be a ter bad thing, but, but, you know. But back to 3D printers, 3D print food, 3D print mi meat. 3D print the pizza. Some of these things already have. We're even finding ways to 3D print body parts like nose and ears and injury um, off planet is a whole different situation, but it can add to the whole stress and quality of your experience when you're sick or injured. So we need to find ways to accelerate and amplify our, our own rejuvenation and really leverage the body's capacity to heal itself. But um, I think 3D printing is wonderful. Maiden Space is our 3D printer up there right now, and not only have they demonstrated how we can 3D print and how we can exchange CAD drawings with people here on Earth, but there was an incident not too long ago, a couple of years ago or so, where we needed a special tool, and they were able, it would have meant flying a whole nother vehicle up to deliver right. the tool, and we were able to do the CAD drawing, 3D print it successfully, and voila, you have it. 
So I think that's a great way to that's give great, Christmas presents or holiday presents or any kind of present for any celebration uh, back on Earth is to have something that we design on space and you kind of get a CAD design space version of some sort of 3D printed gift. So we're celebrating holidays. Definitely, every holiday. Okay, we're celebrating holidays, we're eating. Um, we're Can growing we our own food. I mm -hmm. bet we're growing our own food, okay. Yeah. Can we have babies? <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see. Yeah, we can't. I'll, um, on our own. What we've been able to determine so far from what we've seen <laughs> is that um, physiologically the reproductive system seems to be somewhat protected from the presence or absence of gravity. So physiologically, you're physiologically um, ambivalent to the gravity in your environment. Things still function, fortunately, for our heart, our lungs, and other body processes. Um, on the other hand, we've actually conducted a seminar um, on pediatrics in space. So we are anticipating pioneering in space to the point where we have a community with children and what that might look like. There's a gap in between we haven't quite resolved yet, <laughs> but again, um, we're very much committed to demonstrating proof of concept. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is the kind of phrase that only NASA could use. <laughs> <laughs> only NASA. Go ahead. I, I will say of, we've had multi-generations of fruit flies. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Absolutely. So the fruit I just flies, want to make it clear that I wasn't, seem okay. I wasn't talking about fruit flies. <laughs> yes, oh, oh, I'm sorry. Okay, I'll hold it. No, no. no. Okay, let's, um, a couple more specifics. Uh, a Martian day is a little bit longer than an Earth day. How many hours is a Martian day? It's about 39 minutes longer. 39 minutes longer. And what do we call a Martian day? A soul. soul. Okay, how many, how many souls, in, or how many souls in an Earth year? Or how many, how many Earth days in a Martian year, I guess is the it's way I want to put it. It's about twice as long. The Martian twice as long. Twice as long, yeah. And we have seasons? Seasons, mm -hmm. and we have a day-night cycle. Day-night so, cycle. Mm -hmm. so okay. It's, it's, it's like home. Do we have snow? Yeah, I was going to say, we don't yeah, have... Yeah, it frosts. Yeah. Frost. No okay. flakes. It doesn't snow, it frosts. doesn't snow, but we have frost. And we have windstorms. You've talked about that. Um, but, but the windstorms are not Martian movie windstorms. The atmosphere <laughs> on Mars is very thin, and it's not going to knock anything over even <laughs> in a huge windstorm. So you do have dust storms and you do have wind. But again, the atmospheric density is so low. That uh, rain? No. No rain. So nothing is coming down through that. It's all somehow coming up. Okay. It's condensing out of the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. um, it's difficult. What you're describing is a difficult situation. We're not, um, we're not going to land and then go running around and send postcards home and isn't this wonderful. This is a real commitment. Mm -hmm. Make the case for me. Why should somebody want to do this? I'm from Alaska, so it's not all that extreme <laughs> for me. <laughs> I was talking to some, uh, some people in the desert southwest. When they look at photos of Mars, that, that looks like home to them. So it, it was described as sort of like the, the desert southwest. So um, when you, you know, for you, you live in New York City, so you look at pictures of Mars, and that doesn't look very inviting. No, but I, the pictures um, uh, promoting this, there was a whole city. In the back of the So once there's a good restaurant scene, you're ready, yeah, you're ready yeah. to move. Yeah, I was move. looking at the city. I found the tower I want to live there in. You, you know, go. it's not a problem. <laughs> you know, my answer is scientific. We're going to... We're pretty sure the conditions on early Mars were not that different than the conditions on early Earth when life evolved. And to me, the real impetus for humans is to be have a lot of geologists and astrobiologists up there cracking open rocks, not only finding out that life did evolve on Mars, but finding the extent to which it became complex, finding the extent to which it's different than life on Earth. And that just doesn't take one rock sample. It takes hundreds and hundreds of fossils to allow you to really understand that that takes humans, that takes at least a scientific base on the surface. And what, oh, go ahead, Kim. Can I add to that? Because that absolutely is, is the main scientific motivation and, and, and for me. But there's also a, a bit of a, I want us to make Earth our home. Your home, you only start talking about your home when you leave it and you return to it. 
So you don't, when you're a kid, your town is just town. You only talk about it as your hometown when you leave it and come back. Uh, and so I would like humanity to be able to leave Earth, live somewhere else for a little while, and then come back to their home planet. And I hope that perspective would help us treat it the way it ought to be treated. Before we get further into why Mars, um, Michelle, how do we get back? We need, Kim we need just to made the case that we're coming back here. How do we do that? That is the, to me, that's the most exciting part. So the, the ascent vehicle, the thing that's going to get us back off of Mars so that we can come back home, to me, that's the crown jewel of the whole engineering feat. Um, and, and that's something we haven't, we haven't uh, done. All of the missions we've sent to Mars to date have all been one-way missions. So uh, developing an, an ascent vehicle, um, we hope to be able to pattern it after the ascent vehicle that we'll be building for the moon. Um, ideally, same cabin, maybe a little bit different propulsion system. There's more gravity on Mars. There's a little bit of an atmosphere, so we need a little bit more boost to get off of the planet than we will on the moon. Uh, but we're hoping there's a lot of synergy in those technologies. So we are coming back. Okay, with that in mind, before we finish up, uh, before we go further here, can we have the lights up a little? I'd like to ask a question. How many of you in this audience, and we want to see by hands, would like to take a trip to Mars and come back? That's a fair number of hands. Yeah. Okay. How many of you would be willing to go to Mars and stay there and live for a couple of years? Oh, I see hands. I see hands. Okay. Fascinating. So How many now, of you would go and not come back? <laughs> okay. Good question. And may I introduce our doctor? You can dim the lights again, if you will. Yvonne is on the record as saying she wants to go and live there. Why? Well, we call it pioneering. And it's because, wow, first of all, first and foremost, it's the only way to know is to go. And so exploration has always been a part of the human spirit. And it's the curiosity, the passion, the discovery that are our tools, our true vehicles to get us there. And the only way to know yourself is to go in search of yourself. So until we really go and push the envelope, we don't know the full envelope capability capacity of the human envelope. And to me, that's just something that has to be not just known, but the journey to get there is really the reward, whether we find out the complete answer at the destination. Are you speaking of the journey of you Yvonne Cagle as an individual or the journey of all of us? Um, as Carl, in answer to Carl Sagan's words, um, you know, I aspire to go off planet, to pioneer Mars. And I can only hope that not only should I have the privilege to go, but when I get there, that Carl will be there, that <laughs> you will be there, and that all of you will be there too. So you're doing it in part for everybody and with everybody. It's interesting, the word that is used for putting these habitats, bringing people to Mars, doing all this is terraforming. What does terraforming mean and what's it about? So terraforming is, um, a, there have been scientific papers written about it as well as many, many science fiction books. It is, could we take Mars and actually turn it into an Earth-like environment? So basically, could we cause the atmosphere to become more dense, more oxygen-rich, so that you could walk around on the surface, we could go grow crops out on the surface without having to live in a pressurized habitat? So there are, again, scientific uh, papers that have been written on it that say it's, um, it's feasible. The problem is the mechanisms that have been discussed take hundreds of millions of years, and then, of course, you have to maintain that atmosphere. Again, Mars lacks a magnetic field. Without a magnetic field, the solar wind is constantly stripping the upper layers of the atmosphere away. So the more you were building an atmosphere on Mars, the more the solar wind is trying to strip it away. So it, it's a, I, I think it's pretty tough. I, I, I tend to keep it in the science fiction category myself. Um, everybody has... 3D glasses. We're now going to look at some extraordinary images that NASA has 3Dized. 
uh, to give us a better idea of what it's going to look like. You've heard everyone talking about Sorry. In yeah. sort of Arizona or the Southwest. Let's take a look, and, and our panel is going to try to explain what we're looking at, if not where, what we see from this. All right, this is a, one of the Chasma on Mars. It's a, it's a beautiful chasm that you can see from all those layered deposits in the interior. It's been used by water at some point, so that's a partially water-carved uh, uh, channel on the surface. Those holes you see all over the place are impact craters. And the fact, if you look on the right side of the image, you'll see there were very few impact craters on that high plateau. On the left side of the image, there are lots of craters. The longer a surface is exposed, the more craters it collects. So I can tell you right away, those are two different geologic units. One is much younger than the other. And we don't, Ellen, have any idea what the scale of this is, is that right? No, we don't, unfortunately. My guess is it's probably, um, it, it's that chasm, that chasm is probably a couple kilometers across is my guess, but I, I'm not quite sure where this is. I'd okay. also just like to point out that the depth on this has been exaggerated, yeah. so it's, it looks much deeper than it, it would be in real life. Okay, next picture. This is a great, obviously, perspective view where we, they've been draping an image over topographic information of the surface to give you this multi-canyon view of these beautiful hills on Mars. Again, vertically exaggerated, but not, not quite as much as the previous image. Uh, really beautiful sculpted terrain on Mars. Mars has been heavily eroded by water, and also um, the rocks are worn by the wind and covered in dust, and I just think this is a gorgeous image. It is gorgeous. Whoa, that one's freaking oh, my eyes out. Yeah, my eyes <laughs> There we are. Um, these look like little volcanic peaks almost. I'm not sure where this is actually, but really a, a, a beautiful image and some actual sand dunes um, down in the valley there on the right side of the image. Ah, uh, that's our little Sojourner rover. Uh, this is one of the landing sites from Pathfinder. Uh, those are solar panels on top of that little rover, and you can see it's going to go make friends uh, yeah. with that rock. How big is Sojourner? <laughs> how, how big is Sojourner? Uh, Sojourner is about uh, uh, this, uh, about a less than a foot tall, a foot long, tiny. We've got one in the National Air and Space Museum in Washington, D.C. Oh, go see that. <laughs> Uh, this is an impact crater, uh, it looks like, with um, sand dunes on the base of it. All that, that loose material inside has been blown into all those ripples, which are sand dunes. Looks like water, doesn't it? Yeah, this could is be, another impact be. crater. Impact from an asteroid, probably? Uh, yeah, and these are beautiful, beautiful sand dunes. Uh, we talked about dust storms earlier, a lot of dust on Mars blown around by the wind, forms into beautiful dunes that are, again, pretty analogous to dunes that, that we see here on Earth. I love this image. This is the inside of a wall of an impact crater. But if you look along the rim of it, you can see where there's almost been landslides of material, those kind of smooth triangular deposits that head down towards the floor of the crater. Oh, so this uh, is probably a skylight into a lava tube, would you think? Um, yeah. So it's a little hard to tell without the context, but um, we see lava tubes on uh, Earth volcanoes, such as in Hawaii, and we see what we're pretty sure are lava tubes on Mars. So they're really, really long caves, and then every once in a while the ceiling falls in. So if you can see the hole on the left, it, the ceiling's fallen in, and you can kind of just see the tube continuing off towards the top of the image. And again, there's that material that's gathered and blown in there on the inside. This is almost certainly a skylight, I'd say, yeah. It's beautiful. It makes you want to go and put a habitat in there. It certainly yeah, does. It does. Uh, <laughs> uh, this is Curiosity Rover in Gale Crater. That's Mount Sharp in the background. And uh, Gale Crater has been an amazing place for Curiosity to explore. What we found out over the years is that, um, from all the rocks that Curiosity has studied, is that in the past, again, about three and a half billion, 3.8 billion years ago, this place was potentially habitable. So we don't know that it was inhabited, but the conditions were there that would have been conducive to the formation of life. And those are the 3D images, extraordinary. You don't need your glasses anymore. Nine I kind of like them. Good. <laughs> so, as Ellen was saying earlier, we know a lot. Um, and we know a lot before we get there, and we're going to know a lot 
more after we get there and when we come back, which some of us are doing, except for Yvonne. Um, <laughs> we'll be telling you all about it. Um, just quick final thoughts. When's this going to happen? When do you think we'll be there? Anybody? As soon as we have the will. Sorry? <laughs> I said as soon as we have the will to as get there. As soon as we have the will. Okay, That's I'll accept that. And what happens after Mars? Do we go to other planets, or is, does Mars occupy us for a very long time? We not only go to other planets, we go to asteroids, we go to other galaxies, ultimately, as we learn how to do this better. But, yeah, we just keep going. We I'm just keep going. And, and with that, I want to say thank you to the panel, and let me, let me just mention um, the first science fiction movie I ever saw, we were talking about this earlier, was a movie called Destination Moon. It's a pretty awful black and white, um, <laughs> uh, really tacky movie. Um, but, but I was a, little, a very little kid, and I was astounded. And here's the part that really astounded me. At the very end of this dumb plot, nonetheless, it was, it was a rocket, and it was going to the moon. At the very end, there was a crawl. Crawls when the words come up on the screen. And at the very end of the movie, it said, this is the end dot, 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 of the beginning. And I thought, oh my goodness, we're really going to do this. So I'm now here to say we're really going to do this. Thank you all very much. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you.